Okay, well, um, <clears throat> after this coffee break, we are going to continue. Now we're going to get into the area of some uh, particular vac vaccines. And what we decided to do uh, with Ruth was to, <clears throat> to discuss, uh, to have a presentation on the on vaccines for respiratory infection. Uh, and, <clears throat> and in this presentation, I'm going to give a brief overview of the respiratory pathogens, the individuals uh, at risk, and then briefly discuss influenza vaccines, SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, and pneumococcal vaccines. And in the area of uh, respiratory pathogens, um, this is my, uh, here we have a representation of the respiratory tract. As we mentioned, it's all interconnected, the nasopharynx, the eustachian tube connected to the middle ear, the maxillary sinus, frontal sinuses, the vocal cords, uh, bronchi and alveola. <clears throat> and the three primary respiratory pathogens, influenza virus, SARS-CoV-2, and streptococcal pneumonia. Three primary pathogens that we have uh, vaccines. If we were to look at the, at the manifestation, these pathogens are very similar. And now we're discussing in the break that, that in the United States, it's not just one epidemic, it's what's called the triple epidemic, because we are having COVID that is still with us, plus an epidemic of uh, influenza and an epidemic of respiratory incisional virus. And all our uh, hospitals and, and <clears throat> are full capacity due to the flu and, and RSV. Um, <clears throat> influenza and SARS-CoV-2. I want to use these two viruses as uh, causing essentially the same type of disease. Now, we don't have influenza or SARS-CoV-2 as normal flora. Then they can arrive to the nasopharynx and the patient may have just a mild rhinitis or laryngitis. Um, now, at the same time, influenza of SARS-CoV-2 can cause sinusitis. <clears throat> we know that, that the person with rhinitis, if the virus is in the nose, it's very likely that the virus is going to go to the, to the maxillary sinuses. Um, the virus can go from the eustachian tube and produce middle ear infection, and the patient may have a otitis. Um, any one of these virus can cause bronchitis. I, I remember the first cases that we have of acute exacerbation of COPD with SARS-CoV-2, but these are very common causes of acute exacerbation of COPD. And the worst scenario will be the virus causing uh, pneumonia. And this will be for influenza uh, and <clears throat> SARS-CoV-2. Um, in the case of streptococcal pneumonia, things are a little different in a sense that streptococcal pneumonia is part of our normal flora. Then having streptococcal pneumonia in the nasopharynx is not abnormal. Probably five to 10% of adults are carving streptococcal pneumonia. <clears throat> the, the concepts are probably the one that you are carrying, the, one, the serotype I'm carrying, let's say I'm at this moment, serotype six, probably this is not going to cause disease because I'm more or less having some form of antibody production to the pneumococcus that I've carried, but a new serotype arrived, as Ruth mentioned, used in contact with a child, give me a new serotype, and this is going to give me a problem. And the problems are going to be either sinusitis or it's going to go to the second tube cause um, otitis, bronchitis, or pneumonia. And we know that, that, that there's a, an interplay between virus and bacteria. And we know that it's a common interplay between uh, influenza, um, <clears throat> SARS-CoV-2, pneumococcus, res uh, RSV, um, because we don't, we, don't, we don't know for sure, but we understand that every time that you have uh, bronchitis with a virus is more likely, or you have a middle ear infection with a virus, is more likely that the, this virus is going to be followed by a bacteria uh, because the virus, change the normal flora or because the virus alter the immunity or <clears throat> there is this, um, um, there are different uh, considerations. Or maybe just that the virus uh, alter the, the epithelium and then it's simple for the bacteria to penetrate. The point is that we don't know for sure what, but the combination of viral and bacterial infections in the respiratory tract are very common to the point that most of the autopsies done for patients dying during the Spanish flu 1911 pandemic, they were essentially dying of bacterial pneumonia. They didn't die of influenza. Going back to the history of medicine, 
um, when uh, when they were doing studies of patients dying of influenza, they were able to isolate Haemophilus influenza from patients dying with bacteria superimposed. But since the investigator thought that they found the cause of influenza, the bacteria was called Haemophilus influenza and was presented as the etiology of influenza. And then, um, but, but essentially we know the combination of bacteria and, and viruses. Now in the case of pneumococcus, uh, from the lung or from any other uh, area of the respiratory tract, the, the pneumococcus can produce bacteremia and then everything goes from meningitis, brain abscess, all the way to osteomyelitis, any form of uh, infection. And then when we're dealing with um, um, vaccines for respiratory infections, we do vaccine for influenza, SARS-CoV-2, respiratory infection, in the case of pneumococcus for respiratory infection, and also a vaccine to prevent uh, meningitis. And Ruth mentioned that there are other pathogens that are respiratory pathogens that we have vaccines, <clears throat> but usually are, we discuss mycobacterium tuberculosis, the BCG is for pediatrics. Hemophilus influenza is only for type B hemophilus influenza, it's a pediatric. We don't have a vaccine for the hemophilus influenza uh, in adults. And then we have you know, the pertussis, the diphtheria uh, vaccines. But we're going to then here look at influenza, SARS-CoV-2 and streptococcal pneumonia. <clears throat> Now, when we discuss patients at risk uh, and say, well, who is at risk of SARS-CoV-2? Who is at risk of influenza? Who is at risk of pneumococcus? Really, uh, the, 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 the patients are always the same, or 99% are the same, because we're discussing who is at risk of getting a bad respiratory infection. Then for all the respiratory patterns, we can think, okay, who is at risk of getting pneumonia? And we can say who is who is a candidate for all these vaccines or a, a primary candidate for all these vaccines. <clears throat> then I go back to our study of pneumonia here in, in Louisville. When we look at from the 300,000 adults living in the city of Louisville, we notice that per 100,000 population, there were 350 hospitalizations due to pneumonia. And 349 adults get hospitalized every year in Louisville per 100,000 population. Since Louisville is very representative of the United States because the census of Louisville, and we have a publication indicated that, that Louisville, if we say, for instance, what percentage of the population in Louisville is more than 65? Just happened to be very similar to the United States. What percentage of the population of Louisville is African-American? Very similar to the United States. What percentage of the population of Louisville is, has COPD, very similar to the United States. Then this is why we were allowed to publish our data from Louisville as representative of the United States. What happened in Louisville happened in the United States. That is different from New York City or Chicago because they don't represent the United States. They are big cities, they are different. Um, okay, um, interesting. Just, um, this is, but, but like, let's go back to what happened in Louisville and what happened in the United States. Then 350, patients or persons from Louisville get hospitalized with pneumonia. Ruth alluded that some of us are more than 65 years of age, and this is the immune system is called immunosenescence. It's the gradual deterioration of the immune system due to natural age advancements. Uh, okay. Um, Doesn't sound that bad. No, no, it's, it's very sophisticated. <laughs> Instead of saying you are old, which is your immunosenescence. Um, then what happens if you are old or you have immunosenescence? Um, what is your risk for pneumonia considering the general population? Is Now it's 2,000 per 100,000. 2,000 of the population per 100,000 get hospitalized with pneumonia. It's three times the normal population. <clears throat> now 2,000 per 100,000 is 2% of the population to make numbers. 2% of the population is one in 50. Then every 50 adults walking in Louisville, more than 65, one is going to be hospitalized next year with pneumonia in one of the hospitals in Louisville. But this happened all over the country. Now we are talking population at risk of developing pneumonia. Not just pneumonia, this is hospitalized with pneumonia. There is a, the serious form of pneumonia. 
because you can have the walking pneumonia, you go to a hospital, give you antibiotics. This is the pneumonia that requires hospitalization. This is the role of the immunosenescence. Now, another concept is that immunosenescence doesn't start at 65 because the data, at this data, and almost all data on infection say that when we are more than 50, something happens with our immune system. Then when you are more than 50, your immune system is not the same than when you were 20. This is why we have these discrepancies sometimes that the FDA may approve a vaccine, as Ruth mentioned, and I think that discrepancies still happen for the pneumococcal vaccine, that the FDA approved for more than 50 years of age, but the ACIP more than 65. And then why is the discrepancy? Well, uh, if you look at the immune system, the, our immune system start getting weak more than 50. But you look at how, as Ruth mentioned, how many patients are going to get the disease? Once you get enough patients probably to be a cost-effective vaccine when you're more than 65. But one thing is population health. The other thing is my patient health in front of me. If the patient in front of me is more than 50, the immune system is not going to respond that when the person was 20. Um, and this is the data from Louisville that's showing us this very clear. Now in Louisville, we have also the advantage that we know how many patients, I know more patients, how many people are living in Louisville with different comorbidities, obese, smoking, diabetes. This is very unusual because the city web data from the CDC. Then we can figure out what, how many hundred population of uh, obese or smoking patients get hospitalized with pneumonia. And this is the elderly. What about the other risk factors? These are the other risk factors. Then any person with diabetes or with a stroke is the same that be more than 65, regardless if he has 40 with diabetes. Any person with congestion heart failure or cardiac disease, here, this is 2,000, this is 3,000. This is three times. Patients with lung disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, nine times the risk from the general population. Then having chronic obstructive pulmonary disease should be mandatory to get any of the respiratory vaccines because these patients are going to be under with pneumonia next year, almost everybody. <clears throat> um, now, why is this? Well, in the case of diabetes, we know that the, the macrophages, they are reduced antimicrobial activity, the neutrophils don't work, the monocytes don't work, there are elevated cytokines. There's a lot of abnormalities in what we discuss, the, um, <clears throat> the immune response. Uh, there's also the consideration, the association or, or in the general population of diabetes with, with heart disease. We know you have diabetes, you are at risk of heart disease. And this is the concept that usually these comorbidities don't come alone. Usually the risk multiply because you are elderly, but you have diabetes. Then it's not just three times or three times. Now it's six times. And you have elderly and you have congestive heart failure. Then this is important in the discussion of the risk factors. Uh, and this also is very interesting now, the association of diabetes with lung disease. There's also, you have diabetes, patients with diabetes are at increased risk of even asthma, COPD. Then there's the association of comorbidities that put patients at high risk. Then essentially, high risk for pneumonia, and there's all this literature indicating that probably patients with lung disease, the lung microbiome is abnormal, and this is why they are high risk for for uh, pneumonia. Then these are the risk factors for all these respiratory pathogens. I want to show another data that we have from Louisville <clears throat> that applies to vaccines. Uh, this is the map of Louisville with the census tract. What the, this is how the, the, the census divide the, the city. Um, this is the address. These are the point where the 3,700 patients were hospitalized with COVID-19 pneumonia in the different hospitals in Louisville. Um, using these dots with the address, I can put this into a heat map and give a, a density of the, where are the patients living in Louisville that were hospitalized for pneumonia. And this is the heat map of all the patients hospitalized with pneumonia. Um, we can look at all the data from the census and develop heat maps, but the heat map for the census that best correlate with the heat map of hospitalization for pneumonia is this one, that is adult poverty in the city of Louisville, that we see the, the correlation. <clears throat> then 
uh, poverty and pneumonia. These are some of the factors why poverty is associated with pneumonia. But, but, but here, we need to add the consideration that regardless of comorbidities or regardless of what happened with the patient, poverty by itself is a social factor that you are at increased risk for respiratory infection. Then um, we know that, that, um, that then when we look at our vaccination program, this is another area that should be, uh, that we concentrate because low socioeconomic status, meaning the income level, is, for, is a risk factor to being hospitalized due to uh, pneumonia. And then we have, of course, the immunocompromising medical conditions and immunocompromising treatment, risk factor for pneumonia. I don't want to go into this for pneumonia, this is a lot that we can talk, but, but the idea is that, that, that then we have all the comorbidities, we have social factors, and we have abnormalities of the immune system. Then very quickly, um, influenza. If we were to look at two issues of influenza, I, I don't want to go through all this, but just to remind you that this is influenza virus, there is the, the, the hemagglutinin, this protein hemagglutinin, and the neuranimidase. The hemagglutinin is what the virus used to attach to the sialic acid that is all in our epithelial cells. This is how the influenza virus attached to the nose, to the trachea. Then the vaccines are against hemagglutinin. There's the attachment protein. Um, when I get infected with the influenza virus, I develop antibodies against everything. Uh, but for instance, the neuronimidase is an enzyme the virus used here to be able to get out of the cells. Then the neuronimidase allows the virus to get out of the cell. Then when I use um, the neuronimidase inhibitor or seltamivir, then I don't allow the virus to get out of the cell, but the virus penetrates the cell. When I give a vaccine, I get antibodies against hemagglutinin and the virus cannot infect. We know that influenza A, at this moment, we know that the influenza A virus based on the hemagglutinin and neuronimidase, they have different numbers. The ones that are circulating one are the, the H1, N1, and the H3, N2, and then the influenza virus. <clears throat> um, for influenza, antigenic drift is the minor change of the H and N mutation. Antigenic drift is the big thing that happened when a new virus arrived that is going to give us pandemic. And we know that this minor changes or this drift is what we need influenza vaccine every year. Influenza A virus, use are two lineages, B, Jagamata, B, Victoria. The quadrivalent vaccines for influenza vaccines contain two influenza A antigens, one H1 and one, one H3 and two, and two influenza B. And we know that now we have quadrivalent vaccines, influenza, two for influenza A, two for influenza B. Okay, um, <clears throat> as Ruth mentioned, we follow the, whatever is published in the Morbidity Mortality Weekly Review because this is what the CDC, ACIP agree, and this is the publication. Then a single dose of influenza vaccine should be administered to all adults annually. So this is an adult vaccine course. If you are, what is the, the indication for influenza vaccine? If you are alive, you have an indication. It says it's being alive is an indication for influenza vaccine. This one is very simple. Uh, it's a straightforward. The here, we don't have risk factor, but but we know that we know a person with risk factors because nobody, the large number of the population they get influenza vaccine because okay, I, I don't get any problem. But we know what is the population at risk for getting pneumonia. Well, this is the population that needs to get the influenza vaccine because we know that the worst scenario of influenza vaccine is influenza pneumonia and death or superimposed bacterial pneumonia after influenza pneumonia. Um, now, inactivated influenza vaccines, egg-based, meaning that I get the influenza, I pass it through eggs 200 times until the virus cannot infect human cells, is inactivated egg-based. I can have a standard dose, parenteral administer. I say, okay, these are, this is subunits of vaccine. This will be the, the subunit vaccine. I don't give the full virus here. Have been inactivated, okay, I am injection. How much of the dose? 15 micrograms. This will be the standard dose parenteral. Standard dose needle free, inactivated. Again, this is a jet injector device. It's not a needle. Then you are needle phobic, is the word. 
yes. you are needle phobic, I have a vaccine for you. Um, okay, the standard dose, activated. The idea that I give you the standard dose, but your immune system is not responding, but I'm going to give an adjuvant to be for your immune system to believe there is the real virus inside. Approved for adults more than 65, immunosenescence. Immune system doesn't respond. I give you an adjuvant to help your immune system to respond. The other consideration is I give you a high dose, an intramuscular high dose, quadrivalent, if they approve for more than 65. Then instead of 15 micrograms, I give you 60 micrograms. I give you four times the dose. Then if your immune system didn't respond to 15, I'm going to give you a massive dose of this essential virus that is uh, inactivated and your immune system finally is going to respond. Then two ways to trick the immune system is the vaccine is not, is the, is our immune system doesn't respond. I put an adjuvant to make it respond or I give you more of the antigen to make it respond. Influenza, inactivated influenza vaccine, cell culture. This here you have a, a, a virus that is killed is inactivated. And a virus that is not in egg cells, is in cells, regular cells. Then essentially, if you have egg allergy, it's not a problem. But also, as we mentioned, if you're immunocompromised, you're not supposed to get inactive, you're not supposed to get the, the vaccines that are attenuated. You're supposed to get inactivated vaccines. Recombinant uh, um, vaccines, recombinant hemagglutinin. Remember that I get the gene of the influenza virus that's going to produce the hemagglutinin, the, the protein that's going to attach to our epithelial cell. With this gene, I get it to another cells, and other cells are going to produce the protein, and this recombinant vaccine. This vaccine, I give only the hemagglutinin antigen, because I make this protein only in the laboratory, and I inject just the protein that I'm interested in for you to generate antibodies. The live attenuated vaccine, live attenuated, but this is the nasal spray, egg-based, intranasally administered, only two to 49 years of age. And here's interesting because we, we cannot give a live attenuated vaccine to a person with an abnormal immune system. More than 50 is abnormal. <laughs> you see here? I mean, you see how the, the people are making the decisions, the ACIP say, wait a minute, this vaccine is live. If you are 55, it's not for you. <laughs> because we know that more than 50, something is already happening. Um, now, if you want to really trick the immune system, <clears throat> probably this is another way. You just give the vaccine the way that the normal infection happen. The normal influenza virus get into your nose. Now, you have the influenza virus in the muscle. From the very beginning, our immune system say, what these things is doing in the muscle? I never, I never see this. It's just already something unusual. They don't pay too much attention to the muscle. Then we need to get abjuvants. We need to be creative. You give something to the nose or to the GI tract. This is the real. This is the real way. This is a little more real life. Um, okay, uh, different ways to give the the vaccine. Um, then for healthy, non-pregnant, less than fifty inactivated influenza vaccines only. Uh, <clears throat> um, individuals less than 50 with a contraindication for a live vaccine inactivated. 50 to 64 inactivated. And more than 65 at this moment, quadrivalent high dose uh, inactivated, quadrivalent adjuvated, is not high dose, but you give the adjuvanted, or quadrivalent recombinant, that again is not, um, Live is a recombinant vaccine. Uh, SARS-CoV-2, very quickly SARS-CoV-2. Then this is the SARS-CoV-2 virus. We know that here the spike protein is the one that the virus used to attach to the angiotensin converting enzyme, that is the receptor. Then the virus goes through the life cycle, we generate new viruses. And the goal here with as we need a vaccine is to get enough antibodies that are going to attach to all this spike protein that this virus is not going to be able to infect any other cell because I have enough antibodies, good neutralizing antibodies. Um, okay. When we give, we started to learn about the, the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. Remember that, that we have the two doses and you are fully vaccinated. 
and you get an optimal immune response. <clears throat> this vaccine, we're using the original strains, the Wuhan uh, strain. Uh, we learned that immunocompromised patients were getting a suboptimal response. For you were, you have cancer chemotherapy, you are not going anywhere with the vaccine. What was our response? Well, to be fully vaccinated, you're immunocompromised, you need three doses. Then this is similar to what happened, as Ruth mentioned, happened in pediatric. One dose, and to give you a booster, and to give you another booster, and we keep with booster until you, you get enough. Well, we are doing the same with adult immunocompromised. We give you two doses for everybody. For your immunocompromised, you're going to get another, you're going to get the third dose. But this third dose is part of the initial vaccination. Um, now, in the normal population with optimal immune response, another thing that we learned with COVID was that the waning immunity after six to nine months. Then what is our response there? Our response there was the booster dose. Okay, six, nine months. Let me give you another one. You were already fully vaccinated with two doses, but because I know that this is I'm going to give you a booster dose. Again, this is based on whatever we know of the immune response. A booster dose is going to increase the your um, your capacity of the antibodies to neutralize the virus. It's not so much that you don't have antibodies, it's that the antibodies are not attaching very well to the virus. Then what happened during this pandemic? Uh, a new thing that we learned is that it's happened with influenza, the immune evasion. Then you have the mutation of the spike protein in the same way that with influenza, we have the mutation of the hemagglutinin, we have the mutation of the spike protein, and then we have the Delta and we have the Omicron. And because of mutation, even if you have a good level of neutralizing antibodies, these neutralizing antibodies were working for the Wuhan spy protein, but not for the Delta spy protein, unless for the Omicron spy protein. Then what was the answer? As we discussed before, that you have the bivalent booster dose that is the original strain, is bivalent because they have the original strain plus the strains of Omicron, BA4, BA5, some of the subvariants of the uh, Omicron. Then I may say that looking at what we do with SARS-CoV-2, we're applying everything that we learned from vaccinology, throwing things into this pandemic with whatever we are doing with vaccines and whatever happened with our immune response. <clears throat> um, again, to me, the problem of the message was to say, to the adult population, you get a vaccine, you're not going to get COVID. This usually doesn't happen with adult population. Of course, some patients are not going to get COVID, but most of the patients are going to get the disease. What is going to happen, you're not going to get severe disease, and now we learn, and you're not, to get, you're not going to die, and you're not going to be in the hospital. All these things have been proved now with SARS-CoV-2 and how the vaccines work. And these are the things that we know that we've been discussing happening with the pneumococcal vaccines, with the influenza, but with the other respiratory vaccines. Okay, then this is, is uh, um, then what we are saying that, that, that in our, the, the effectiveness of the PCV13 in our study was 70%. That this mean that, this mean that 30% of the patients getting the vaccine still were hospitalized with pneumococcal pneumonia for one of the 13 serotypes. But I'm sure I don't have enough patients, but I'm sure if I follow this patient compared to patients without the vaccine, this patient didn't die. This patient didn't go to the ICU. There is still there is some level of protection. Even though in my study, there were vaccine failure because 30% still were hospitalized with pneumococcal pneumonia with one of the 13 serotypes. And this is what we see now with SARS-CoV-2. We see the, the, the protection. Uh, okay, um, then we have monovalent vaccines in the United States, the two mRNA vaccines, plus now the Novavax, the COVID-19 vaccines with the recombinant protein. This is, again, the, this is the cell producing the, the, the protein. Then the Novavax is using the old methodology. I give you the antigen. And then we have two new vaccines, the mRNA vaccine use the new methodology. I give you the gene. Um, 
And then the bivalent vaccines are the two mRNA uh, vaccines. For the first series, for here, for the, you get the first dose, second dose, or third dose, this is the monovalent vaccines are indicated here. The bivalent vaccines are only for the booster with the bivalent uh, vaccine. But this will be the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines um, today, and we have the recommendations from the ACIP regarding the uh, bivalent booster dose. And finally, the, the pneumococcal vaccines that, that going back to the pneumococcus, going back to the capsule of the pneumococcus, go back to the polysaccharide, we have the polysaccharide. Now, how many different polysaccharides are there? At this moment, there are more than 100 different types of polysaccharides. Since the pneumococci are serotype based on the polysaccharide, we have more, more than 100 types of pneumococci. Uh, in the case of the, uh, when we discuss the uh, hemophilus influenza, the, the polysaccharide have letters, hemophilus type A, B, C. In the case of the uh, meningococcal, the polysaccharide have letters, not A, B, M, Y, W. In the case of the pneumococcal, the polysaccharide have numbers. Zero so type one, two, three, six, 19. Uh, it's good because you already have 100. The letters are not going to be enough. <laughs> Similar to the SARS-CoV-2, the alphabet, the Greek alphabet. Well, they, this is why we have to have the subvariance Omicron because we keep using letters. We run out of letters very quickly. Uh, then we have all these polysaccharides with different numbers. Um, then we have at this moment, for adults globally, I would say globally, four vaccines. The, the polysaccharide 23, and we discussed this is just the polysaccharide antigen versus the conjugated vaccine, conjugated 13, 15, 20. <laughs> when we look at the, the, the MMRW risk factor for pneumococcal infection, <clears throat> are the risk factor for pneumonia. Except CSF leak, a cochlear infarct, implant, that is a risk factor for meningitis. Then, because we're giving a vaccine here for pneumonia and meningitis. Then you have CSF leaking from your nose because you have a break in the, you have trauma and now you have CSF. Well, of course, the pneumococcal is going to get into your brain directly, it's going to give you meningitis. You need to get the pneumococcal vaccine, not to prevent pneumonia. You may be a 25-year-old, get trauma, and you need the vaccine to prevent meningitis. But in reality, 90% of the indication is for to prevent pneumonia. We followed in the United States, <clears throat> the ACIP. And the ACIP says you have prior vaccination. There are two considerations. You get the PCV20, the 20 conjugated vaccine, <clears throat> or you get the PCV15 conjugated, followed by the uh, polysaccharide 23, is usually one year, except in immunocompromised individuals, that is uh, eight weeks. <clears throat> Common questions. For this vaccine now, the three most common question: What happens if I patient has prior uh, PPSB23 and PCV13? There was the prior indication: PCV13 followed by PPSB23 in one year, no further vaccination. The person is fully vaccinated against pneumococcal disease until today. This is another thing that we always need to mention to our patient. This is the recommendation today, because we know next year is going to be a different recommendation. They would never say you are fully vaccinated because once we have a, a conjugated 40, we are going to vaccinate everybody again. Uh, prior PCB 13, <clears throat> the polysaccharide 23 in one year, prior polysaccharide PCB 20 after one year, that these are the most common questions for the pneumococcal vaccines recommendations uh, today. Then <clears throat> I want to finish saying that for these three pathogens, we are always discussing the acute outcome. The acute outcome is I prevent for you to have pneumonia. I prevent for you to go to a unit. I, I, I may prevent for you to have the disease. <clears throat> and, and I'm thinking this is in the next weeks that you have the disease. One thing that we learned with pneumococcal pneumonia, with influenza pneumonia, but now it became very common <clears throat> with SARS-CoV-2 is that <clears throat> pneumonia is a chronic disease. You have pneumonia, you have acute problems, you have one of these respiratory patterns, you have chronic problems. Then we have the, now the, everybody has a clinic in every city for long-term COVID because you get COVID and a significant number of patients don't go back to normal and they have problems after COVID. 
Well, uh, we knew that this happened also with pneumococcal pneumonia, and this happened with influenza. We have long-term consequences of all these uh, viruses. And now there is even an interest when we, of course, if you give a vaccine, this is, should be part of the discussion of respiratory vaccines. I give you a vaccine, you may Theory, virulent form of COVID, the less virulent form of pneumococcal, this is virulent form of influenza, and you may be at less risk of the long term pneumococcal pneumonia. The pneumococcal will go to your heart, and then you have heart disease after pneumococcal pneumonia. Can the pneumococcal vaccine? Of course, you prevent pneumococcal pneumonia, everything is simple. You prevent all long-term consequences. But even if you get consequences, in, in our, as Ruth mentioned, in our face-to-face -face discussion with a patient, uh, these are all considerations. Now we cannot show the data, but this is consideration that we don't only prevent disease, but we prevent poor outcomes. And we don't only prevent poor acute outcomes, we may prevent poor long-term outcomes in patients with respiratory infection. Then essentially <clears throat> review the respiratory pathogens, what the patient risks are all the same. Uh, what happened with the influenza vaccines, the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines and the pneumococcal vaccines. And I stop here and Ruth now is going to give us the overview of 